Indiana. It's spanned by vast fields of corn and soybeans, making it one of the most agriculturally productive states in the country. Stunning sand dunes, one of the only national parks in the Midwest, stand hundreds of feet tall over the shores of Lake Michigan, and beautiful forests, hills, and river valleys cover much of the state's southern half. Home to a major city, a number of smaller ones, as well as the suburbs of one of the largest metropolises in the world, it's home to a fairly large population. A former industrial powerhouse whose limestone and steel built some of the country's most famous buildings, it today maintains an important role in the country. Indiana is a unique and fascinating state, and the 20th place I will cover in the U.S. Explained, a 56-part series on every state, territory, and federal district in the country, by order of admission. Hello and welcome to That Is Interesting. I'm your host, Carter. This is the U.S. Explained, episode 20, Indiana. According to the Keppen climate classification, the long, thin state is divided almost perfectly in half between two climate zones. The southern half in the humid subtropical climate zone with hot summers, mild winters, and humidity, and the northern half in the cooler, hot summer, humid continental climate zone, with four distinct seasons, hot summers, and cold winters. It's just about in the middle in terms of rainfall, getting on average 41.86 inches of precipitation a year, which places it at 27th out of the 50 states. The southern half of the state generally gets a little more precipitation than the northern half. It's divided between two time zones as well. Most of the state sits in eastern time, including its largest city, Indianapolis, but the northwestern and southwestern corners are both in central time. Both are due to the location of cities there near state lines. In the northwest, suburbs of Chicago like Gary, Hammond, and Portage sit not far from the Illinois border. Nearly 700,000 people live in Chicago's Indiana suburbs, and 50,000 of them commute across state lines every day for work. With the region revolving around a city in another state, it wouldn't make sense to divide some of Chicago's suburbs into a different time zone, so they're located in Central. It's a similar situation with southwestern Indiana, the corner of which juts out between Illinois and Kentucky. The Indiana city of Evansville is located there, not far from the other two states, so it and a number of surrounding counties are in Central as well. Though these corners take up very little of Indiana's land, over 17% of its population is in a different time zone from most of the state. It's nicknamed the Hoosier State, and people from Indiana are officially known as Hoosiers. It's the only official state demonym that isn't based off of the state's name, and it's a term Hoosiers are proud of, and you'll never really hear anyone from Indiana call themselves Indianans or anything else. No one can seem to agree on how the term Hoosier came to be. And there are a number of different theories that the Indiana state government lists, such as it coming from a Native American word for corn that might not exist, being the last name of a boat owner who liked to hire workers from Indiana, being a shortened version of who's here when people would knock on cabin doors, or even whose ear after bar fights broke out. The theory that I found most compelling and that the state government lists as the most probable traces it to the Saxon word for hill, who. In Cumberland, a region in the north of England just south of the Scottish border, this word for hill became Hooser. Immigrants from Cumberland, the theory goes, brought the word with them to the United States, where it turned into Hoosier and came to be used for people who live in the hills. In the hilly southern part of Indiana, the word caught on and locals started using it to refer to themselves. I'm sure there are many other theories as well. If you're from Indiana, go let me know in the comments where you think the word Hoosier originated from. As a lot of early highways and routes west cross through Indiana, you'll also hear it nicknamed the Crossroads of America. The word Indiana comes from the term Indians, a misnomer for the indigenous people of the Americas that was given by Christopher Columbus, who had been trying to reach what Europeans called the Indies. The Indies referred to all of Asia from India all the way to countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines. That's where Columbus initially thought he landed and called the local native people Indians, a term that was used for much of history but has fallen out of use considering it's incorrect and confusing. Even today, the islands of the Caribbean are collectively called the West Indies. 
1763, the powerful Haudenosaunee or Iroquois Confederacy set aside a section of land they'd conquered in what is now West Virginia for a land company from Philadelphia. The company referenced the Iroquois in naming the section of land, calling it Indiana or the Land of the Indians. Virginia, whose colonial claims were enormous, disputed it and won out over the so-named Indiana Land Company. Eventually, though, as the U.S. was breaking up the massive lands once claimed by Virginia, they needed names for the new states and territories. In the case of Indiana, they took up the name of the former Indiana Land Company, even though they had not used a name for the same land. If you've seen other videos in the U.S. Explained, you know I'm not a fan of the state seal on blue background design, which Indiana does not do. Though it has the dark blue background, which is pretty overused, there's no state seal, and it has a simple and recognizable design that looks good and makes it stand out. All in gold, it shows a torch for liberty with rays of light shooting out, and 19 stars in various rings around it, as Indiana was the 19th state, and it says Indiana in very small writing. I think it's a really nice flag, in my opinion one of the better state flag designs in the country. Indiana takes up 35,826 square miles, or 92,788 square kilometers. This places it on the smaller side, at 38th out of the 50 states, and all the states that border it are larger. It's slightly smaller than Kentucky and slightly larger than Maine. Its population, however, is on the larger side. With 6.79 million people, it ranks 17th out of the 50 states. Less people than Tennessee, but more than Maryland. Home to a large city, a number of smaller cities, rural areas that are fairly heavily populated as well as the suburbs of a number of major out-of-state cities, Indiana has a population density that's on the higher side. With 189 residents per square mile, or 73 per square kilometer, it sits at 16th out of the 50 states, with a lower population density than North Carolina but a higher one than Georgia. Indiana sits in the north central part of the eastern half of the US, in the region known as the Midwest. It's also part of the region known as the Rust Belt, a former powerhouse of industrial cities and towns surrounding the Great Lakes, which has since seen some of the most severe population decline and job loss in the country in recent decades as industrial jobs were replaced by automation and outsourced overseas. Gary, once a major city that was one of the largest cities in the state and a huge center of steel manufacturing, has also been one of the hardest hit places by the decline of the Rust Belt, seeing its population decrease by 61%, one of the highest rates of any city in the country, so much so that much of its downtown is abandoned and in ruins, and is often seen as the epitome of industrial decline in America and the issues the Rust Belt faces. Overall though, Indiana is faring better than most of its Rust Belt neighbors, while states like Michigan, Illinois, Ohio, and Pennsylvania have seen a much more stagnant, plateauing population, Indiana saw the same trends but in the last few decades has seen its population increase again pretty significantly, making it a bit of a regional outlier. It's been powered by growth in Indianapolis and its suburbs, as well as the suburbs of Louisville and growth in smaller cities like Fort Wayne and Lafayette. It borders four other states and has a shore on a great lake. To its east sits Ohio, to its south Kentucky, to its west Illinois, and to its north sits Michigan as well as Lake Michigan. Indiana's borders are fairly simple. Its border with Illinois starts at Lake Michigan, the north-south border dividing Chicago from the Indiana suburb of Hammond. It actually continues for three and a half miles out into the lake, so if you're in this park in Chicago and walk out onto the breakwater, you'll eventually reach a tiny pen exclave of Indiana. It continues through the Chicago suburbs and through the rural agricultural parts of the states for 163 miles or 262 kilometers until it reaches the Wabash River just downstream of Terre Haute. From there, it follows the Wabash southeast until it meets the Ohio River, forming a point. On the other side of the Ohio sits Kentucky. The border follows the winding course of the river upstream, generally flowing from east to west, though Kentucky typically owns most of the river itself. It passes through the city of Evansville and later turns to the northeast, dividing the Kentucky city of Louisville from the suburbs on the Indiana side like Jeffersonville and Clarksville. At the mouth of the Great Miami River, it becomes a north-south border with Ohio. The city limits of Cincinnati sit just five miles away on the other side of the border, and a few suburbs on the very edge sit on the Indiana side, the loop of highways around the city dipping into the state for a tiny bit. From the Ohio River, the Indiana-Ohio border is a straight line north for 179 miles or 288 kilometers. 
It then becomes a north-south border with Michigan for just four and a half miles until a spot near the town of Clear Lake where it turns west, with Michigan sitting to the north of the state. It continues west for 104 miles or 167 kilometers until it reaches the shores of Lake Michigan at the town of Michiana Shores, created from combining the names of Michigan and Indiana and directly across the border from the Michigan town of Michiana. It then continues across the lake as a water border for 36 miles or 58 kilometers until it reaches the north-south part of the Illinois border not far from Chicago. The border though switches from Michigan to Illinois about halfway across the lake with Illinois water sitting north of Indiana for a ways. The long and thin state is geographically quite different from north to south, and that's visible in the culture of its different regions as well. The northern two-thirds are flat and agricultural, smoothed over by glaciers that left behind rich soil that has turned it into an agricultural powerhouse. Corn and soybeans are grown there across the northern and central parts of the state, and it's the eighth largest agricultural producer in the entire country. Like much of the Midwest, this flat land and fertile soil has meant that not only is most of the region dominated by cropland, but you can easily build a house nearly anywhere. This has left much of Indiana dotted with small towns as well as a number of smaller cities. There's less true wilderness here. In rural areas, it's generally no more than a 10 or 15 minute drive from one small town to the next, and even outside of the towns, you're rarely very far from your neighbors at all. The state is home to a number of major rivers. The Ohio in the south, and in the flatlands to the north, the water flows in a number of different directions. The St. Joseph flows into Lake Michigan, the Kankakee into the Illinois River and then onto the Mississippi, and the Maumee flows into Lake Erie. Much of the state is dominated by one large tributary of the Ohio. The Wabash River, fed by other rivers like the White River and the Tippecanoe, starts just across the border in Ohio, flows across the north-central part of the state, and then along its western edge, eventually forming its western border. Most of the state sits within the watershed of the Wabash. The northern third of the state is home to Indiana's lakeshore, and sits right on the southern tip of Lake Michigan, a strategic location that was important in its development. The lakeshore is home to the beautiful Indiana Dunes, a string of impressive sand dunes beside the lake that are one of just five national parks located in the Midwest, the only national park in the state, and one of the newest in the country. I've been to the Indiana Dunes, and they're certainly worth a visit. Nicknamed the region, the area around the southern tip of Lake Michigan is also a huge population center. Chicago, the third largest city in the country and one of the largest in the world, sits just across the border in Illinois, and its suburbs such as Gary, Hammond, Portage, Merrillville, East Chicago, and Whiting stretch into the northwestern corner of Indiana. Altogether, the Chicago suburbs in Indiana are home to 673,000 people, making it collectively the second largest urban area in the state. Surrounding it are a number of smaller cities that haven't yet become absorbed into the Chicago suburbs, like Valparaiso, Laporte, and Michigan City, but are well within the orbit of the city. There's also a number of other smaller and medium-sized cities in the northern part of Indiana. South Bend and Elkhart sit on the St. Joseph River in the very north of the state, not far from the Michigan border. The suburbs of the two smaller cities overlap and even stretch into Michigan. Home to the famous University of Notre Dame, South Bend is the third largest urban area centered within the state, home to 279,000 people in it and its suburbs. Elkhart sits at number 6 with 148,000 residents. Fort Wayne sits at the headwaters of the Maumee River in the northeastern part of the state, not far from Ohio. Home to 336,000 people, it's the second most populous urban area centered within the state. The Chicago suburbs are home to more people and it's a nice, smaller size but fast-growing city that serves as the urban core of northeastern Indiana. Northern Indiana is also home to other smaller cities and larger towns like Goshen, Plymouth, Logansport, Huntington, and Auburn. Northern Indiana was initially settled by people of mostly British ancestry moving west from New England, and they've left their mark culturally. Northern Indiana feels very distinct from the more culturally southern south of the state, as well as from central Indiana. It's also the part of the state that really feels like the Rust Belt. It sits on the Great Lakes, cities like Gary, Whiting, Hammond, South Bend, and Fort Wayne were major centers of industry, and it's culturally got a lot in common with other parts of the industrial Great Lakes, like Chicago, Detroit, Toledo, and Cleveland, influenced by black migrants from the South, as well as Poles and other Eastern Europeans, and Irish immigrants who came to work in industrial jobs in Northern Indiana cities. Though it's seen population decline in the past, generally northern Indiana is doing pretty well and is beginning to grow again, especially around Fort Wayne. Central Indiana revolves around the state's capital and by far its largest city, Indianapolis, 
a planned city in the center of the state on the White River. It's home to 1.7 million people in it and its suburbs, making it the most populous urban area in Indiana and the 32nd largest in the country, smaller than Cleveland, but larger than Cincinnati. The Indianapolis suburbs are the wealthiest part of the state, and the whole urban area is fast growing, having driven most of the state's increase in population in recent decades. A number of other smaller cities are spread throughout central Indiana. Lafayette, a college town across the Wabash River from Purdue University, is home to 157,000 people, making it the fifth largest city in the state. There's also Terre Haute, not far from Illinois on the Wabash River, as well as Muncie, Newcastle, Kokomo, and Anderson. Still agricultural, but with less of an industrial feel than the north, central Indiana culturally and geographically feels very much like the classic Midwest, and it's generally fast-growing and economically strong. Though outside of Indianapolis and Lafayette, it's seeing rural population decline. The southern third of Indiana is a really interesting cultural mix of Midwestern and Southern. It's also the most unique part of the state geographically. Hills begin to rise up and much of the southern part of the state, such as the scenic Brown County, is covered in forest. You might not think of forests or hills when you imagine Indiana, but the state and the Midwest overall have a lot more geographic diversity and regional differences than people often give them credit for. It's generally a mix of rolling hills, forests, and farmland, not unlike neighboring Kentucky, and in fact it shares a lot of cultural similarities to Kentucky. Sitting on the Ohio River just across from Louisville, it similarly has one foot in the Midwest and one in the South. Much of the region, for example, was settled by Scots-Irish Southerners, whose ancestors came west through Kentucky, Tennessee, and North Carolina. Its largest city is Evansville, the fourth largest urban area in the state, home to 207,000 people in it and its suburbs. It sits on the southwestern edge of the state, right on the Ohio River across from Kentucky and not far from Illinois. Louisville, Kentucky's largest city, sits right across the river from Indiana. Slightly smaller at 203,000 people, the Louisville suburbs stretch across the river. The Indiana cities of Jeffersonville and Clarksville sit right across from downtown Louisville, so they very much feel like a part of the city and are culturally and economically tied together. The Ohio River is the main artery of the region and a huge population center. Many of Indiana, Kentucky, and Ohio's larger cities sit along the river, their urban areas stretching between states, and a number of cities, large and small, sit either within Indiana or across from it, with suburbs stretching in. These urban areas sit right on both sides of the traditional north-south border, and because of that, the cities and the rural areas on both sides of them, such as southern Indiana, are a fascinating cultural mix of southern and midwestern. On the Indiana side is Evansville, and right across from Indiana is the Kentucky city of Louisville as well as the smaller Owensboro. Even a few of the suburbs of Cincinnati stretch across the border into Indiana. Away from the river and closer to Indianapolis, just west of the hills of Brown County, Bloomington is the seventh largest urban area in the state, home to 110,000 people. It's a college town, home to Indiana University, a beautiful campus made of Indiana limestone, and it's a fun, popular small city with beautiful natural areas right at its doorstep. On the other side of the hills, the small city of Columbus is basically an architect's playground. Industrialist J. Irwin Miller, whose Cummins Corporation was based in the city, knew that when he was making job offers to potential new employees, Columbus wasn't a particularly appealing place to live. The city was in decay and struggling. The wealthy Miller loved modern architecture and set out to transform the town into an architectural showcase, offering to pay all architect fees for any buildings designed by famous modern architects. Architects such as I. M. Pei and R. O. Saarinen designed stunning new buildings that transformed the city. Today, it's been listed as the sixth most architecturally significant city in the United States, despite being quite small, and is one of the fastest growing places in Indiana. What is now Indiana was originally home to a number of different indigenous peoples. Ancient peoples such as the Mississippians built large cities home to massive earthen mounds, such as the Angel Mounds near Evansville. They were followed by peoples such as the Potawatomi and Peoria in the north, the Wea in the west, the Osage in the south, and the Miami, Kickapoo, and Kaskaskia in much of the region. As European colonists arrived in North America, they brought with them diseases such as smallpox, which the native people of the continent had not been exposed to and as such had little immunity. Disease decimated the continent's indigenous population, killing 90% of them, and those that survived often died at the hands of colonists, as Europeans expanded their settlement westward. A confederation of Iroquoian peoples in what is now upstate New York, known as the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois Confederacy, built a fur-trading empire, invading a swath of the continent as far west as Illinois. 
Local tribes fought back in a bloody conflict known as the Beaver Wars, but eventually the Iroquois took control, and the region became part of a large hunting and trapping ground. Meanwhile, on the Atlantic coast, as European colonial settlement grew, the native people there fled west, many settling in what is now Indiana. Tribes such as the Shawnee from what is now Pennsylvania, the Lenape who lived in Delaware, New York, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey, the Mohicans from upstate New York, the Wyandot from Ontario, and the Nanticoke from Maryland all fled into Indiana. The first Europeans to colonize the region were the French, who made it part of an enormous colony they called Canada. This section of Canada was mostly used for fur trading, aside from a few forts at places like Vincennes to keep control of French interests. Few French settlers actually moved to Indiana. For the most part, they allied themselves with the local native people who traded with them for valuable furs. British settlers, though initially confined to the Atlantic coast, were pushing west across the Appalachians into the Ohio Valley. A strategic location, the Ohio River was as far east as a tributary of the Mississippi River reached, and control of the river would allow Britain access to the resource-rich interior of the continent. War broke out between Britain on one side and France and Spain on the other, with various native peoples allied with each side. Called the French and Indian War, Britain won and took control of the colony of Canada, which they renamed Quebec. Conflicts between native people and the British engulfed the region, such as Pontiac's Rebellion, and Britain, not wanting to risk more war, prevented British settlers from crossing the Appalachians, so it was mostly home to native people at that point. As part of the treaty ending the Revolutionary War, much of the British colony of Quebec was made a part of the newly independent United States. Mostly wilderness, home to a large native population in a few French towns, all the new American lands once part of Quebec were, though for a few years claimed by Virginia, made into a massive territory called the Northwest Territory. Though some were allies of the new country, many of the native people of the territory were opposed to U.S. control, especially as American settlers pushed west across the Appalachians and began settling in the Northwest Territory. The United States and native tribes often waged brutal war against one another for control of the Northwest Territory. The settlement of the territory by American settlers saw many native people killed or pushed west. The territory was seen as one of the country's first frontiers. Settlers and pioneers crossed over the mountains to establish towns and farms and try their luck in what was then the country's western wilderness. As its population grew, the federal government began breaking it up into smaller territories and admitting them as states. The first division of the Northwest Territory came in 1800. It was split in a line extending from the tip of Michigan's lower peninsula down to the Ohio River. The area to the east of it remained the Northwest Territory. The land to the west of that line all the way to the Mississippi River became a new territory, given the name of an old land company that had made claims on the other side of the Ohio River, the Indiana Territory. Just three years later, the southern half of the Northwest Territory became the state of Ohio, and its borders with the Indiana Territory were ironed out to what they are today, and the rest of the lower peninsula was given to the territory. Two years after that, the peninsula was broken off of Indiana and became the Michigan Territory. Another four years after that, in 1809, Indiana was shrunk down to its current borders. Everything to its northwest became the new Illinois Territory. In 1811 to 1813, the territory was the site of the last major resistance in the region by native people against American expansion. The governor of the Indiana Territory, William Henry Harrison, wanted the native people of the territory to cede more land to the government so they could open it up to settlers and increase its population so that the territory could gain statehood. He negotiated with the leaders of a few tribes and drew up the Treaty of Fort Wayne, which gave a huge swath of land that had been under the control of a number of native tribes to the territorial government. However, many native people living there were very unhappy with this result. Tribes like the Shawnee had been left out of negotiations completely, which saw more U.S. settlers pouring onto their land as a result. Shawnee leader Tecumseh was infuriated and led an army of many different native peoples in what was called Tecumseh's War. Tecumseh's Confederacy lost the decisive Battle of Tippecanoe to Harrison's army near what is now Lafayette. It marked the beginning of the end for Native American sovereignty in the Indiana Territory, and saw William Henry Harrison rise to fame that would eventually result in his election to the presidency. It also saw the territory's population increase dramatically as new settlers poured into the region, mostly Germans from Pennsylvania and Irish and English from New England and New York. In that decade alone, Indiana's population went from 24,000 to 147,000, and on December 11, 1816, it was admitted to the Union as the 19th state, Indiana. The new state's population would skyrocket upwards in the following decades. For settlers crossing the Appalachians, Indiana was a promising destination. 
the Ohio River was one of the main routes west, and boats often stopped in Indiana, bringing in new settlers. The falls of the Ohio, located between Indiana and Kentucky, meant that ships traveling west would have to stop, dock, move their goods, and disembark their passengers there if they wanted to move further downstream. This strategic location turned the area into an early major port, and cities developed on both sides of the river. Louisville and Kentucky, and on the Indiana side, many of the state's earliest cities, such as Clarksville, Jeffersonville, and New Albany. Corydon, Indiana's first capital city, wasn't far from the falls. Boats weren't the only way to go west. A few decades after statehood, the country's first major road, the National Road, came to Indiana. Settlers could travel by road or by ship up the Potomac River to Cumberland, Maryland. From there, the road took them across the Appalachians through Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Ohio, Indiana, and later Illinois. The road brought people to the center of the state, through the towns of Richmond, Terre Haute, and the new capital city, a planned town in the very center of the state, called Indianapolis. On top of that, settlers traveled north across the Ohio from neighboring Kentucky and the south. Many were Scots-Irish, descendants of people from Northern Ireland, whose ancestors had moved there from Northern England and Southern Scotland as part of the British colonization of Ireland. The flat, fertile state soon became filled with farms and small towns. In its first decade of statehood, Indiana was home to just 147,000 people. Just four decades later, in 1860, its population had increased tenfold to 1.35 million, making it the fifth most populous state in the entire country, surpassed only by New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Illinois. Huge waves of German immigration helped its population grow. German immigrants moved across the state, many of them farmers who sought out Indiana's agricultural land. Today, their descendants make up the largest ancestry group in the state, at 21%. During the Civil War, Indiana remained loyal to the Union. Though most of the war was fought in the South, Indiana was right across from the border state of Kentucky, and one battle was fought within the state, in Corydon in southern Indiana, and the Confederacy captured the town of Newburgh on the Ohio River near Evansville for a few days, the first northern town captured by Confederates during the war. The state contributed hundreds of thousands of soldiers to the Union cause. Key in Indiana's rapid success post-war was not just its strategic location for settlers in fertile farmland, but its role as an industrial and manufacturing powerhouse. Railroads like the Baltimore and Ohio or B&O Railroad connected it to cities on the East Coast, and northern Indiana especially would turn the state into a manufacturing giant through its role in the steel industry. The state's location ensured it would rise as a major steel producer. Steel production essentially requires two main ingredients, iron and coal. Coal can be found in a number of different states, but some of the largest producers, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Ohio, and Kentucky, are all in the Appalachians. Indiana and Illinois both have large coal deposits as well. Deposits of iron ore, however, are mostly concentrated around Lake Superior, in Minnesota's Iron Range, and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Iron got shipped by boat out of cities like Duluth, Minnesota, across Lake Superior, and to the rest of the Great Lakes. Meanwhile, coal would be transported from the Appalachians to the lakes, where it could meet the ships carrying iron and be smelted in the steel, and the steel shipped by boat or rail from there to the rest of the country and the world. Because of this, America's most prominent manufacturing cities all developed around the Great Lakes. Albert Henry Gary founded U.S. Steel in 1901, and a few years later began building a massive complex of steel mills at the southern end of Lake Michigan where the ships carrying iron could meet the transports of coal from Indiana, Illinois, and Kentucky. Gary's steel manufacturing plants needed a place for workers to live, and he built a company town that he named Gary after himself. The city grew quickly to nearly 200,000 residents, the second most populous in the state after just Indianapolis. John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil built a massive oil refinery in nearby Whiting, just across the border from Chicago. The Whiting Refinery was at the time the largest oil refinery in the entire country, and 20% of all oil production in the U.S. came through Whiting. It helped that all these industrial cities in northern Indiana were located near the rising megacity of Chicago. They were able to take advantage of the city's status as a rail and transportation hub, as well as a destination for immigrants and migrants seeking industrial jobs. Chicago grew because the Chicago River, which flowed into Lake Michigan, and from it the St. Lawrence River in the Atlantic, has its headwaters very close to the Des Plaines River, which flows into the Illinois River and through it to the Mississippi and the Gulf of Mexico. It's the closest to the watershed of the Great Lakes gets to the watershed of the Mississippi, and so it became the site of a portage, where people would get out of boats and move their cargo a short distance to the other river. 
Eventually, canals connected the two, further ensuring the city's strategic success. One of those canals connected the Displains to the Calumet River, a Lake Michigan tributary whose mouth is less than 2,000 feet from the Indiana border, and another canal called the Indiana Harbor and Ship Canal connected the Calumet to Lake Michigan in the Indiana city of East Chicago, and in doing so, connected Indiana to the systems of trade and transportation that linked the Mississippi to the Great Lakes and made Chicago what it is today. Further east, another Lake Michigan port, Burns Harbor, was linked to the canal system as well. Connected to it, as well as growing rail and highway lines, Burns Harbor in East Chicago developed enormous steel mills and joined Gary as some of the largest steel producers in the country, all concentrated in one little corner of Indiana. Immigrants and migrants poured into Gary and other lakeside cities near Chicago to work industrial jobs in Indiana's factories, mills, refineries, and ports. These industrial cities of northern Indiana generally followed the same migration trends as neighboring Chicago. Immigrants from Poland and Ireland flocked to northern Indiana and were in part responsible for its massive growth as a population center, contributing to the culture and history of the region. Sitting just north of the traditional north-south border and a major center of industry, Indiana became a destination for black Americans from the south as well. Black Southerners fleeing segregation, racist Jim Crow laws, and an exploitative system of labor called sharecropping made the journey north as jobs opened up in manufacturing and industry during the World Wars, and what was known as the Great Migration. Many of these migrants came to Indiana from states sitting directly to the south of it, like Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, and Mississippi. Indianapolis, as well as cities near Chicago like Gary, were major destinations for Great Migration migrants, and saw Indiana gain a pretty substantial black population. At the same time, the KKK, a racist, anti-Catholic, anti-Semitic, and anti-immigrant hate group, rose to prominence in Indiana in the 1920s. The Indiana branch of the Klan was particularly powerful. During the first half of the 20th century, Indiana had more Klan members than any other state, and in most counties, 30, even 40% of men in Indiana were members of the KKK. They operated during that time as a powerful political machine, endorsing candidates who pushed their hateful agenda. At their peak, they were responsible for the election of Governor Edward Jackson, rumored to have been a member of the Klan himself, and basically controlled by the hate group. Their reign in the state lasted for decades, and was a very dark moment in Indiana's history. Indianapolis, which had already seen success due to its status as the capital city and its location on the National Road, continued to be an important transportation center. It had a centralized location between both population centers and natural resources, and as such became a major railroad hub. More industry followed. Surrounded by agriculture and filled with railroads, it became a huge pork packing center. In 1876, an Indianapolis pharmacist named Eli Lilly founded a pharmaceutical company he named after himself. It would grow to become an enormous pharmaceutical supplier and is today the largest company in the state. Studebaker, once in a huge automobile manufacturer, was founded in South Bend and was responsible for much of the city's growth, making Indiana a major automobile manufacturer. Indiana is also known as a huge producer of limestone. Southern Indiana, near the town of Bedford, is filled with limestone quarries, and the limestone that built iconic structures such as the Empire State Building, the Pentagon, the Biltmore, many of the buildings in Chicago, as well as many of the monuments and buildings in Washington, D.C., like the National Cathedral, the Treasury Building, and the Lincoln and Jefferson Memorials, are made, at least in part, out of Indiana limestone. Most of Indiana University in Bloomington is built out of limestone from nearby quarries, and it gives it a really beautiful campus. Indiana, northern Indiana especially, saw major challenges with the decline of the Rust Belt. Studebaker was bought out, later went bankrupt, and stopped producing vehicles, hurting South Bend, which was in many ways a company town. Gary was one of the hardest hit cities in the entire Rust Belt. Once Indiana's second largest city, it lost 61% of its population since its peak, as the American steel industry has been in decline and companies have moved jobs overseas. Gary was always dependent on the steel industry, and huge layoffs and closures have been devastating. It saw a huge white flight, as white people left the city while black people often refused credit, insurance, loans, mortgages, and other services that had helped many poor white people rise into the middle class often had nowhere else to go. These practices plunged black neighborhoods like those in Gary into poverty, and while white people fled elsewhere, many black people, due to the economic consequences of redlining, often could not afford to move to the suburbs or were simply refused when trying to buy homes there. As the once diverse city's economy declined, it became more and more de facto segregated. At the height of the Great Migration, Gary was 18% black. Today, it's 80%. Not because more black people moved there, but because most white people left. 
Having lost more than half its population, one of the highest rates of population decline in the country, it's often described as one of America's few ghost cities. This isn't entirely fair, as plenty of people do still live there, but it was built for a much larger population than it has today, and so many of its downtown buildings are completely empty. If you visit it, you'll see boarded up windows and buildings and houses that are empty, burned out, or windows smashed in, roofs caving in. It's one of the few places in the country where you'll see large downtown buildings that are completely abandoned. Many of them have been torn down, and the city is filled with vacant, overgrown lots where they used to be. Whole blocks of the city are just empty. Today, 13,000 buildings in Gary are abandoned, and people will actually visit to explore these old industrial relics. It's a place that's eerily beautiful in its own way, but it's also somewhere a lot of people call home, nearly a third of whom live in poverty, one of the highest rates in the entire country. The rest of the region around Lake Michigan has been becoming more and more suburbanized. Gary and other cities nearby were always in Chicago's orbit, but were more independent. As they declined and the suburbs of Chicago sprawled further into the state, towns and rural areas that used to be more independent have become pretty suburban, and a lot of your typical upper and middle class suburbia has taken over a lot of the region whereas the area on the lakeshore itself remains very industrialized, though less busy. Even though Gary itself was hit particularly hard, Indiana's been more successful than other Rust Belt states in recent decades. Other cities like Indianapolis and Fort Wayne have done well, with much more diversified economies. Even the steel industry didn't see as much decline as in other steel giants like Pennsylvania, and Indiana's the country's largest steel producer today. Indianapolis especially has seen rapid growth, especially in its suburbs, which have become quite wealthy. It's the largest city in the state by far, home to 1.7 million people in it and its suburbs, which makes it the 32nd most populous urban area in the country, and it's also the capital city of the state. It sits on the White River, a non-navigable tributary of the Wabash. It sits nearly exactly in the geographic center of the state. The land it sits on was specifically selected to build Indiana's capital city in a place where it would be accessible to Hoosiers from all corners of the state and its streets are laid out in a grid around a circle in the very center of downtown, which surrounds the massive and beautiful Soldiers and Sailors Monument. Because it's a planned city, it's filled with parks and canals with trails and river walks alongside them, as well as memorials. Indianapolis has more war memorials than any other city in the country other than Washington, D.C. There's also a memorial to Robert Kennedy's famous speech in the city after Martin Luther King's assassination, in my opinion, one of the greatest speeches of all time. It's home to brick roads downtown, historic older buildings and newer skyscrapers like the Salesforce Tower, which is the tallest building in the state. Most of Indiana's tallest buildings are in Indianapolis, and it's home to a large string of parks and malls that stretches downtown, lined by museums, memorials, churches, and government buildings. Its capital building sits right downtown and is a beautiful building made of Indiana limestone. There's a lot to do in Indianapolis, or Indy as it's often called. It's filled with museums like the Children's Museum of Indianapolis, the largest children's museum on earth, and is home to restaurants like the famous St. Elmo Steakhouse. Indianapolis, however, is most famous for the Indy 500. The 500-mile motor race is one of, if not the, most prestigious automobile races in the world. The largest sporting event in the world that takes place in one day, it's held at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, or the Brickyard, a huge racetrack that has the largest capacity of any sporting venue in the world able to fit as many as 400,000 people. It's home to unique neighborhoods like Broad Ripple Village and the Wholesale District, as well as large, sprawling suburbs like Carmel and Fishers. On top of that, the beautiful hills and forests of Brown County are only an hour's drive south, so nature isn't far away at all. Fort Wayne is a much smaller city, home to 336,000 people in it and its suburbs, the second largest urban area centered in the state, though it's smaller than the Chicago suburbs in Indiana. Formerly the site of Kekionga, the capital city of the Miami native people, and later a series of colonial and American forts, the small city sits where the St. Mary's and St. Joseph River flow together to form the Maumee River, a strategic location that helped the city's success. The northern Indiana city was a huge manufacturing center, and was where the video game console, the gas pump, and the fridge were all invented. Today, it's a really nice small city and the urban anchor of northeastern Indiana. Today, 78.5% of Hoosiers are white, 9.3% are Black, 7.1% are Latino, and 2.4% are Asian American. The state is home to a large German American and Irish American population. 21.4% of Hoosiers have German ancestry, making it the largest ancestry group in the state, and 11.4% have Irish ancestry. It's also home to the third largest Amish population in the entire country, after nearby Pennsylvania and Ohio. And in fact, it has the largest proportion of residents in the country that are Amish, 
nearly 1% of the population. Many Amish lead a traditional lifestyle, not using cars and a lot of technology, and live in farming communities, raising barns and riding horses and buggies. They live in rural areas in both northern and southern Indiana. In large part because of the state's Amish community, German is the third most spoken language in the state, when it's only the tenth most spoken in the country overall. Religiously, Christianity dominates in Indiana. 72% of Hoosiers are Christian, and other individual religious groups at most only make up 1% of the population. Most are Protestant, 52% of the state's population, and most of them, nearly a third of all Hoosiers, are evangelicals. The two most iconic Indiana foods are the pork tenderloin sandwich, a sandwich made with a thin piece of pork that's deep fried and served on a bun, and the sugar cream pie, a custard pie with cinnamon sugar on top. The largest newspaper in the state is the Indianapolis Star or Indy Star in Indianapolis. It's home to a number of renowned colleges and universities. There's Purdue and West Lafayette, the flagship campus of Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana State in Terre Haute, and Notre Dame, a famous Catholic university outside of South Bend. A number of popular TV shows like Parks and Recreation and Stranger Things are set in fictional Indiana towns, though neither are filmed there. Indiana is home to two major league sports teams, both in Indianapolis. There's the NFL's Indianapolis Colts, who play at the Lucas Oil Stadium, and the NBA's Indiana Pacers, who play at the Gamebridge Fieldhouse. The Chicago suburbs, though, tend to root for Chicago rather than for Indianapolis teams. Its busiest airport is the Indianapolis International Airport. Its largest companies include health company Elevance in Indianapolis, Indianapolis pharmaceutical giant Eli Lilly, Cummins in Columbus, and Steel Dynamics in Fort Wayne. Probably the most famous Hoosier is Michael Jackson. Him and the rest of the Jackson family are from Gary. Other famous Hoosiers include David Letterman, James Dean, Dean Norris, Steve McQueen, Jenna Fisher, Larry Bird, Kurt Vonnegut, John Green, and though he's most associated with Kentucky, Colonel Harlan Sanders. No presidents were born in Indiana, but one, Benjamin Harrison, based his political career out of the state. He was born not far across the border in Ohio near Cincinnati, and moved to Indianapolis as a young adult, became a lawyer, and was eventually elected senator from the state before being elected to the presidency. Additionally, Harrison's grandfather, William Henry Harrison, had been Indiana's territorial governor and had previously served as the congressional delegate from its predecessor, the Northwest Territory. Afterwards, though, he continued his political career out of Ohio before winning the presidency. Abraham Lincoln was born in Kentucky and built his political career out of Illinois, but he grew up and spent most of his childhood in a cabin in the forests of southern Indiana. There have also been two recent vice presidents from Indiana. George H.W. Bush's vice president, Dan Quayle, was a congressman and then senator from Indiana before serving as vice president, and Donald Trump's vice president, Mike Pence, was a congressman and then governor. Pete Buttigieg, the current secretary of transportation, was the mayor of South Bend who rose to popularity during a surprisingly successful presidential campaign. Current Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Roberts, is from outside of Michigan City. Politically, Indiana is a reliably red state. It has a Cook Partisan Voting Index, or PVI, of R plus 11, meaning in a given presidential election, Republicans do about 11% better in Indiana than in the country on average. Though it's been very red in recent elections, Indiana actually narrowly voted for Barack Obama in the 2008 election. Out of Indiana's nine members of the House of Representatives, two are Democrats and seven are Republicans. Both of their senators, Mike Braun and Todd Young, are Republicans, as is their governor, Eric Holcomb. That is it for Indiana. I want to give a big thank you to everyone who's already joined my Patreon. Through it, you can access different things such as behind-the-scenes videos, early access to maps I create, an exclusive Discord Q&A with me, ad-free content, and shoutouts to my videos such as these. Please be sure to check out the TII store, where you'll be able to purchase all sorts of official That Is Interesting products and merchandise, including shirts, hoodies, embroidered beanies, masks, mugs, embroidered backpacks, laptop stickers and sleeves, and so on. Also, please subscribe to my brother's channel, Quinn the Cameraman. He made the great intro at the beginning of this video that I'll use in all the US Explained videos, so go show him some support. I try to be pretty thorough with this video, but I know there were definitely things I missed as there was a lot to talk about. I want to give a big thank you to everyone from Indiana who helped give me information for this video, leaving detailed and informative comments on YouTube as well as Discord. I truly would not have been able to make this video without all your help. My next video in the series will be on Mississippi. I've never been there, so I'll need all the help I can get. If you're from Mississippi, please respond to my community post or my comment here, or leave something in the Discord server to let me know what you'd like to see included about your home state. I really appreciate the well over 700 of you who have already joined my Discord server. If you haven't joined the Discord server yet, it's a great place to continue conversations with the topics discussed in these videos, interact with fellow viewers, and help provide information about upcoming states in this series. It's a great community, and we do fun stuff like geography game nights, live podcasts, and so on. 
I'll put links to both the Patreon and the Discord in the description. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope you learned something new. Subscribe for more content like this. I cover the countries, cities, people, and places of the world and beyond. These videos will leave you saying, that is interesting.